Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie, and this is episode number 746 for December 23rd, 2018. Coming up in a few minutes. At first, it was imagine if we had a website. Then it was imagine if we had a single barrel. Then it was, oh my God, imagine if we, you know, could hold a Happy Van Winkle night. And then it was, you know, imagine if we could go to America together. And it's all, you know, not in that order, but it's all happened. The bourbon boom is not just an American fad. The whiskey known as America's native spirit is becoming more and more popular around the world. Andrew Watson and Ed Rosie are two of the six founders of the British Bourbon Society. And in just two years, they've gone from the original six members to more than 2,000. I'll talk with Andrew and Ed later on WhiskeyCast in depth. And yes, I'll get their take on the impact of the European Union tariffs on bourbon and other American whiskeys. That's coming up later on, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, and on Behind the Label, an explanation of just how nuclear weapons testing half a century ago can help determine whether a so-called vintage whiskey is the real thing or a modern-day fake. It's all just ahead on this edition of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the war comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no red breast. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. Edrington has completed its plans to sell off some of the Scotch Whiskey Company's assets. A deal has been reached to sell Glen Turret Distillery in Perthshire to France's Art and Terroir Wine Company, led by Silvio Dens. No purchase price was announced. The deal follows last month's sale of the Cuddy Sark blended Scotch whiskey brand to France's La Martini Cays. This will be Art and Terroir's entry into the Scotch whiskey business, and Edrington has agreed to provide technical assistance during the transition after the deal closes next spring. Glen Turret has been the home of the famous Grouse Visitors Center for many years. No announcement has been made yet on the future plans for the tourist attraction. On that note, Diageo's plans to build a new brand home for Johnny Walker in Edinburgh are moving ahead. The BBC reports talks are underway with the owners of the former Fraser's department store building on Prince's Street in downtown Edinburgh. That store closed in September. Diageo executives confirmed the talks, but declined to comment while negotiations continue. The project would also require approval from Edinburgh Council. The Johnny Walker experience is part of Diageo's plan announced this past spring to invest £150 million over the next three years to upgrade the visitors' centres at 12 of its distilleries in Scotland. Meanwhile, Ian McLeod Distillers is ready to start work on bringing the long-closed Rosebank Distillery in Falkirk back to life. Plans for the revival were announced in October of last year, and while there has been a lot of work done since then, the company's Gordon Dundas says it's all been on paper so far, but that is about to change. We are waiting for one final piece of planning, um, which I think uh, should be imminently, um, and then we are we are we are literally going to be going with it. So. Um, we are uh, we're very excited about that, and um, you know we've just planning and is a difficult thing, but uh, we're getting the right noises, and we're we're very excited about uh, about getting on with Rosebank Rosebank year next year. You're going to hear a lot more about Rosebank. We're going to get everybody involved with what we're doing in terms of the restoration of the distillery, and also of course keeping people up to date with maybe some of the new releases that will come out next year. So 
there's lots of exciting things going on at Rosebank. So, um, yeah, there's never a dull moment here at Ian McLeod, let me tell you, Mark. So where do things stand in terms of having to rebuild the distillery? Now that you've had a chance to get inside there and your team has gotten inside yep. and looked around, how yep. hard is it going to be to uh, get the distillery up and running? Um, well, I mean, it's you know, it, we're, we're on the existing site. We're going to retain as many of the existing features as we can, the chimney, the, the canal site buildings. But effectively, most of the other parts are going to be new. So it's going to be a, a new still house. We're going to have new washbacks. We're going to have all the elements. They'll be the same style, but they're going to be new. So it'll still be triple distilled. It'll still be one tubs. It'll still be Oregon pine washbacks. And all those things will still be the same. But uh, effectively, all the existing plant uh anything that's remaining will be replaced because it's been not used for 25 years so uh you know um it's pretty much a, a, a start from scratch but taking a lot of what was the existing rosebank um footprint in terms of the shape of the stills the, the capacity the worm tubs and all those sorts of things so we've got a, we've got a plan to uh once we once we get our planning to get on with it and uh you know we're looking hopefully in September 2020 to be uh, producing spirit. Ian McLeod acquired all of Diageo's existing stocks of Rosebank Single Malt when it bought the rights to the brand last year in a separate deal from the acquisition of the old distillery site, which had been sold off to Scottish Canals after Rosebank closed in 1993. Dundas says the first bottlings from those casks are likely to be released in mid-2019, We'll have more details as they're available. And plans for a whiskey maturation warehouse complex in Ireland's County Westmeath are back on track. Back in February, we reported on Westmeath Council's vote to reject planning permission for the 12 warehouse complex near Moivor on the grounds that it would scar the landscape and lacked architectural merit. Alan Wright appealed that decision to the ABP, Ireland's National Planning Board, and on Wednesday, the ABP overruled the local objections and will allow construction of the $169 million project. The board ruled that it is appropriate to allow maturation warehouses to be located away from built-up areas and that this project would not seriously detract from the landscape. Scotch whiskey veteran Ian McMillan has spent the last several years bringing Bladnock Distillery in Wigtown back to life. Now he has decided to step aside and move into the consulting business. He'll be leaving Bladnock at the end of January and told us in an email that he has fully delivered on what he originally came to Bladnock to do. No word yet on who will take over for him at Bladnock, and we wish Ian the best of luck. The budget stalemate in Washington led to a partial shutdown of the U.S. government early Saturday morning. The Treasury Department is one of those agencies affected by the shutdown, and depending on how long it lasts, there could be an impact on the whiskey industry. The Treasury Department's Tax and Trade Bureau is completely shut down, except for those personnel who process excise tax payments or are part of ongoing criminal investigations. But no label approval applications or distilled spirits plant permit applications will be processed during the shutdown. Presumably, someone will be at the TTB office in Washington to pick up the mail, since the Postal Service is not covered by the shutdown, and that means public comments can still be submitted about the agency's proposed widespread changes to federal regulations that cover distillers, brewers, and winemakers. What may be the most controversial of those proposed changes covers barrels, specifically a definition for what a barrel is. The regulation in effect since 1935 requires whiskey and other spirits that have to be matured use an oak container. But the agency's staff wants to define that a bit more closely and use the term barrel for the first time. The proposal would define a barrel as a cylindrical oak drum of around 50 gallons capacity. And that is where all hell broke loose. The agency wants to know whether smaller barrels or non-cylindrical shaped barrels should be acceptable, and craft distillers have been speaking out loudly over the last couple of weeks. 
Richard Hobbs owns the Barrel Mill Cooperage in Avon, Minnesota, and has been building small barrels for craft distillers since 2004. I don't know what they're trying to do, Mark. Um, I'm not sure if they're trying to define it. Is it actually a barrel? Because right now, right, it's a, it's a new charred oak container. So I think, you know, with a lot of these companies, uh, they're coming on board um, and basically, you know, throwing out a stainless steel drum with, with oak heads on it. Uh, I think they're trying to, I mean, that's my hopes. I hope they're not trying to, like, cut out the small guys only because, you know, it takes big money to go on big barrels for the long run. So, you know, ho- I hope that's not the case. I hope they're more trying to define it as it is a barrel. I mean, we've been using small barrels for hundreds of years. That goes all the way back to the Scots and the Irish who were using those little small barrels that you could carry on the back of a donkey, right? That's right. What would happen to your business if this were to go through and uh, they set a 50-gallon minimum size? Well, we would uh, we would probably, I mean, it would be devastating, not only to us, but to our customers. And that's number one in my thoughts. Millions of dollars worth of aging inventory across the country. Um, we would have to totally try to retool, revamp, probably lay off half our crew right off the bat. Um, yeah, it would be devastating. We're going to file a comment. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of smart, smarter people. A lot of my clients have way smarter than me. And, and trust me, uh, everybody's in here and, uh, I, I, I really don't see him doing that. I mean, why would, why would you come in, you know, with the, uh, the FET, you know, regulations to help the small guys and then turn around and smack them in the face, you know? It doesn't make any lot of sense to me. So, yeah, I hope it's just like tightening up the regulations a little bit. What have your clients told you? You mentioned that they've all been in there. What have they told you about this? Oh, they're very concerned, uh, you know, and making sure that we're on top of it. Um, you know, a lot of the purists, they're, they're not a big fans of the uh, small barrels, but, eh, you know, we just, uh, our client, Distillery 291, he just uh, won the best rye whiskey in the world in our 10-gallon barrels. So, you know, it can be done. The proof's in the pudding. I think uh, there's, there's, there's room for more innovation, not less. The public comment period for the TTB's proposed changes ends on March 29, 2019. We have a complete copy of those proposed changes with the whiskey-specific areas highlighted. You'll find it in the news section at whiskeycast.com. New whiskeys to mention this week. Scotland's Arbiki Distillery has released what it's calling the first rye whiskey distilled in Scotland in more than a century. The Highland Rye Single Grain Scotch Whiskey is distilled from rye, wheat, and barley grown on the family farm. And I know what you're probably thinking. How can it be called a single-grain Scotch whiskey when it's distilled from rye, wheat, and barley? Remember, Scotland's laws require any whiskey that's not made from 100% malted barley to be labeled as a single-grain Scotch whiskey when it comes from a single distillery. Only 998 bottles will be available worldwide, the recommended retail price is 250 pounds. That's about $316 a bottle. Earlier this month, we heard from master distiller Jim Rutledge about his plans for a new distillery in Kentucky. But Jim and his partners have also been busy reviving a vintage bourbon brand. Cream of Kentucky Bourbon was originally owned by Shenley, and distilled at several of the company's distilleries in Kentucky. It went away a few years ago, but Jim has acquired the brand and is bringing it back using sourced whiskeys. The first version is 11 and a half years old. It's bottled at 51% ABV, with 9,000 bottles released in seven U.S. states and the District of Columbia. No word on pricing. Johnny Walker is out with its annual Chinese New Year release of Blue Label. This year's edition celebrates the Year of the Pig on the lunar calendar. 
and the label features an illustration by artist Chrissy Lau. It'll be available in limited quantities worldwide. Tamatin is releasing its first ever 50-year-old single malt. There are just 70 bottles of the oldest Tamatin ever bottled. It carries a recommended retail price in the UK of £10,000. That's about $12,645 US at current exchange rates. And Tamatin is just one of eight distilleries along Scotland's northeast coast that are joining forces to create the first Highland Whiskey Festival this May. It'll run from May 12th through the 20th, right in between the Spirit of Speyside Festival and Fajil on Isla. The other distilleries in the festival are Balblair, Kleinleash, Dalmore, Glenmorangie, Glenord, Wolfburn, and Old Paltney, and each one will have its own open day during the festival. Now, you just have to get vacation time for the entire month of May. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul. As you're celebrating the holidays with friends and family, Highland Park reminds you to celebrate responsibly. Remember, a little Highland Park goes a long way. Check out the entire range at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. 2019's festival calendar kicks off on January 11th and 12th with the Harrow Whiskey Festival at London's Grimsdyke Hotel. The Edmonton MS Whiskey Festival is on January 16th, followed the next night by the Calgary MS Whiskey Festival in Alberta. And please join us again this year for special coverage from the Victoria Whiskey Festival in Victoria, British Columbia, the 17th through the 20th. The Whiskey Exchange in London has a tasting of this year's Diageo special releases with Colin Dunn coming up January 21st. Buffalo Trace Distillery kicks off a new legendary craftsman dinner series with Chef Edward Lee on January 25th in Frankfort, Kentucky. The Whiskey X Los Angeles is on January 25th, and Hansa Spirit 2019 is January 31st through February 2nd in Hamburg, Germany. Right now, we have 144 different events on the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. And we're adding new events all the time. Just use the search button to find one near you or wherever you're traveling in 2019. Everyone knows the expression, "'Tis better to give than to receive." At Redbreast, we don't think the two are mutually exclusive. Maybe it's better to give Redbreast and receive. Like receiving a glass or two right away for your thoughtful gift of Ireland's definitive single pot still whiskey. Or receiving that, hey, thanks again for that bottle of red breast, a month later. Or receiving that shout out in a wedding speech for introducing the groom to red breast, completely overlooking the fact that you introduced him to his bride as well. What we're trying to say is, introducing someone to red breast will come back to you in unexpected ways. Red breast, you've landed on something special. Now be sure to share it. Proud sponsor of Whiskeycast. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. We have talked a lot on Whiskey Cast about the global boom in bourbon sales, at least from the corporate side. But what is driving that increase in bourbon sales? It appears to be a lot of pent up consumer demand for something different. In 2016, six British whiskey lovers realized they all had something different in common a love of bourbon, and they formed the British Bourbon Society. Last time around, I shared my tasting notes for the Society's single cask bottling of an Uncle Nearest Tennessee whiskey. It's just one of several casks they've been able to get their hands on, but it's also the first ever single cask bottling of Uncle Nearest. That prompted me to get in touch with the Society, and I spent some time on the phone this week with two of the founders, Andrew Watson and Ed Rosie. It was around about three three years ago now. Um, we well, 
passionate about American whiskey. There's a few of us speaking with each other via Twitter, um, but very quickly realised that there was no platform for us to, you know, to, to chat in the UK. Really, we, we realised we were speaking with people in in the, in the US quite a lot, which obviously, you know, if you're speaking about American whiskey, that's that's a given. But we, you know, there was quite a few of us that 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 liked this, um, you know, that were passionate about it and. You know, there was no tasting to go to. It was, you know, the, the scene was very uh, immature, and we put ourselves into a, uh, a message group via Twitter, and that kind of grew into us. And there, there was about six of us, really. Um, that grew into us arranging to meet at a whiskey bar in London, you know, to to talk and get get nerdy and share samples, that that kind of thing. You know, the the, the things that we knew that the guys in the States were doing. And, um, yeah, very quickly from, from there, we decided to start a, a society, albeit with the six of us, just so that we could start doing things that, uh, you know, we, we really wanted to do, like put on tastings ourselves. And yeah, we, we used Facebook as the, the platform for that because it was, it was easy. It was ready made. It was right there. And, you know, they've, they've got the, uh, uh, you've got the ability to do that quite quite simply, and we used um, used that group to yeah entice other members uh, to join, and obviously the tasting that we've started to put on got a lot of attention. We partnered with whiskey bars in London. I've mentioned Milroy's; it's a very prominent one based in Soho. It's one of the oldest uh, whiskey shop in in London, I believe, perhaps even the UK. And yeah, we, we, we put on tastings with them. We partnered with American restaurants. Obviously, many of them have got uh, decent American whiskey selections because it comes with the territory of having an American themed restaurant. And, but nobody was really drinking it. So we kind of brought the, the enthusiasts to them. So it was, it was a reciprocal arrangement and that kind of worked out. And from those tastings, our membership grew, uh, from those six people to, who were the founders to, to over 2000 today and you know that kind of growth is in line with growth of american whiskey in general and especially in the uk um, but also testament to the, the amazing things that we've been able to do um, as the group has grown such as sourcing single barrels from uh, distilleries i know you mentioned you got to try our uncle nearest single barrel and yeah we, we we've got a lot of brands looking to partner with us and you know, doing a lot of cool cool things so it's it's a labor of love but it's it, it's growing all the time are you surprised by how quickly the uh, club grew yes and no i'd say um yes in that in a very short space of time it's, it's got to you know 2000 but i think we we knew very early on that you know we weren't the only ones that liked this uh, you know, we knew that there were more of us out there that just needed a place to go. And we we just kind of provided that place. Ed, is it a case of where you guys were all sort of hidden away, sipping on bourbons while uh, most of your compatriots in the UK were drinking scotch and you guys just sort of needed a place to get together? Well, I think that is probably what helped us sort of grow and be the sort of you know mouthpiece for american whiskey in in the uk because most of the groups that existed before us were scotch based um uh, still you know now i think we are the main bourbon group i don't actually know of any others and if they are they're just small break-off groups but yeah i think that there's always been a slightly kind of stuffy a vibe around um, scotch whiskey in particular because it's always i think andrew you always used to say that it's kind of seen as you know, tweed wearing old gentlemen who are sipping on scotch and it's never really been massively appealing to uh, a younger audience or maybe a sort of, it's just, it's just felt a little bit old. But I think, you know, there's been a massive boom in bourbon and I think we started this group at, at the perfect time. And I think we've enjoyed the growth over the last three years that the industry's seen. And that's probably why, you know, our membership base has grown as well. Now, how much of your membership base is actually based within the UK as opposed to being um, online from around the world? Well, basically, you know, if we're looking at 
statistics within the Facebook group is a good indicator of, you know, where people are based geographically. I think for the most part, the group is fully around uh, 70% UK, and that's a, that's a bit of a guess. Uh, we have quite a lot of people, obviously, in Europe, uh, and then there's a number of, of people, key people who are based in the US. I mean, I'll be honest with you, we try to... Uh, we try to not we're not trying to stop people coming into the group who aren't UK based, but we're we've always been careful not to just open the doors to everyone because what we noticed and what we wanted our group to be um, different to others and how we wanted it to be different was that we wanted to try and curate that user base and make sure that the people that were coming into the group were actually going to. Uh, you know, make meaningful contributions and share content in interesting ways and have discussions that we would find interesting. I think it's easy, especially with Facebook, to just open your doors to thousands of people and get a little bit fixated on that number growing. When actually, without sounding brutal, we decline quite a fair few people that ask to join because either through experience or just through you know, where they might be based in the world, we know they're not really going to contribute to the conversation a great deal. Sometimes what we do is we message them and we say that, hey, uh, we, we've seen you, you know, you're trying to join the group once or twice. We just wanted to check, you know, one, you're not a robot and two, that you're actually interested in, in getting involved in a conversation. And I think that that's something that I always feel is important to mention because, you know, it's 2000 people and it's growing all the time, but it's 2000 really engaged people. If you look at the statistics, especially from Facebook, I mean, I think the last time I looked, which was quite recently, uh, we're having an engagement of almost like 80%, which is pretty crazy for a Facebook group. That is good. Uh, I imagine there's a lot of whiskey groups that would love to have that kind of engagement. What do you think drives it? Uh, Andrew? I would say, I mean, back to your point about the, the fact that we have trying to make sure the right people are in the group. Secondly, uh, part of that is that it's not just uh, people buying bottles that are in the group. It's uh, we've we've got people who are able to interact directly with distillers. We've got brand ambassadors, distributors, retailers. It's a group for everybody, not just um, you know those that like whiskey. I mean, everybody likes everybody in the group likes whiskey, but it covers uh, every part of the industry. I think it's engaging for everybody. Because of that. Yeah, I think that that's kind of what I meant when I was saying key people before. I mean, you know, through lots of different, you know, discussions with brands and people and Andrew was probably out of all of us that met in that Twitter group, the most connected when it came to people in the US uh, and just industry people in general. And, and that group, what we, you know, key people are like very influential people in, in the whiskey world. I mean, if you spoke to a lot of the, the main master distillers in the US, I pretty much bet your bottom dollar they've heard of the British Bourbon Society now because we've gone out of our way to make sure they know who we are. And we've met most of them and we've worked with a lot of them, uh, you know, even from having dinner with uh, Preston Van Winkle through to regularly talking to Brent Elliott. You know, there are, we've got good communications with most of the, most of these guys. Tell me how the bourbon scene has grown in the UK. I remember being over there last year in October for the whiskey show and talking to some of the American whiskey distillers that were there and uh, doing a video piece on it for Whiskey Cast HD. And they were talking about bourbon being up and coming at the time and really having a hard time keeping it on the shelves because there had been so much demand for it. Uh, yeah, I mean, Andrew, yeah, you probably best place to answer that. No, I mean, um, in, in terms of the, the, the growth of bourbon in the UK, I'd say th there were, I'd say, even, you know, if you're looking at it even a year ago, there were what, maybe 50 craft brands on the shelves. And that, that's, at, that's at a stretch um, a year ago. Now there's, there's, there's probably double that. In, and that's probably in line with the amount of distilleries that are now you know, around the U.S., I think there's probably about 1,500 distilleries now in the U.S., but also because there's so many more people drinking it, and that's just a combination of um, culturally. People people like Americana um, over here. As they latched onto bourbon, I think, better than they have any other straight spirit, in my opinion, because it goes so well with cocktails. I think bars have 
gotten on board with bourbon very quickly. Um, you know, the old fashioned, for instance, is the number one drunk cocktail in, in the UK, uh, in the bar scene here. The sign of a good bartender is you, you can you t- tell a good bartender by the old fashioned they make you. And it's all of those things combined. And it's difficult to see where the, you know, where it's going to start slowing, but um, long may it continue. Well, long may it continue, but uh, I'm kind of curious what the impact has been the last several months with the tariffs and what that's done to bourbon prices, uh, because you guys are the ones paying for these things now. Well, that that could all change in March next year, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the tariffs are, I mean, I can't talk particularly eloquently on this because as a consumer firsthand, I, I don't think I've really seen the tariff effect yet i think some brands are absorbing those costs at some point down the line at the end of the day uh that can either get absorbed by the retailer um it can it is there's lots of different points uh, down the line as far as i understand that where it can be absorbed but i personally haven't seen a huge knock-on effect yet i've noticed that some company i know i was speaking speaking to someone actually a couple of days ago that worked at a very large um well-known uh spirit store in the uk and there are a few lines that they're bringing in uh, which are seeing that increase. But I don't know, to be honest with you, if I, if, yeah, like I say, if I've really noticed it yet. But I think it really depends at the moment. The UK especially is in a political limbo and whether or not something meaningful happens with Brexit in, in March, it could sway one way or the other. Have you seen some of the smaller brands disappear from the shelves where the no. importers aren't ordering new stocks of it? Because we're being told over here that uh, by some of the distillers that their European clients and colleagues are just not reordering into the UK. Well, I know, yeah, I know that, um, well, for example, the craft scene in the UK is, is doing well at the moment. And there are lots of craft distilleries that are trying to break into the UK market. There are some that have done it particularly well. I think few would be a good example. And Sonoma have had a reasonably good run at breaking through and I think the craft scene is brutal isn't it I mean you've got young whiskey your lesser known brands you've got no, no, nowhere near as much profile and you typically have to price your bottles quite high to cover your overhead so they're in a bit of an uphill struggle anyway but it's a survival game isn't it in terms of you know breaking markets is hard whatever's going on in economics is just a difficult thing to do but I don't know. I think I think we actually have a healthy amount of craft distillers here. It is, sometimes it's hard to keep track of it. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. And I think also with with craft, it's different. You know, once people have paid, like Ed said, a lot of them are quite the bottles are quite expensive because most of it is you know covering their their initial overheads plus the fact that you know, most of the bottle is tax and duties over here, which which may, already makes it expensive. But what that means is that People will potentially buy a bottle of the spirit, but you know it's probably a one-time purchase. Whilst you know every other bottle is probably you know Heaven Hill, Buffalo Trace, that kind of thing. You know the, the regular, the, the usual suspects. So whilst they're not reordering, it doesn't mean that people aren't drinking craft spirits. There are, and to that point, there's just lots more craft spirits to choose from, and it, it's a there are winners and there are losers, and it's yeah the. I don't know which ones aren't, aren't being reordered, but I, I, uh, there are some that are good and there are some that are bad, like, like all whiskey. But. I mean, it's also, it's worth, you know, Andrew and I have um, had quite a few conversations with um, uh, with smaller distilleries. And I don't want to get into naming names because I don't think it's fair, but I think we've had quite a lot of conversations with, with those that are trying to break the UK market. And sadly... I don't know, like to really get known as a brand, you need a marketing budget uh, or you just need to have a very good product. Um, you know, there's a product that, that is around three years old at the moment, which is getting exceptionally good reviews and people are talking about it. There are other products that are five, six years old, which no one's talking about. So really, it does come down to the quality of the product you're making or if you've got enough money to shout about it in the right places. Um that's just the way the world goes around, unfortunately. What advice would you give? Because uh, 
We have a lot of craft distillers in the U.S. who listen to Whiskey Cast, and I'm sure some of them would like to break into the U.K. market. Besides making sure they have some money for marketing, what other advice would you give them? Give us a call. <laughs> give the British Bourbon Society a call. We, 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 we'll help you out. No, I mean, my advice is if you're serious about doing this, you can't just dip your toe into the, the UK, UK market. You have to come prepared with a bit more of a focused strategy. You may need a brand ambassador. Somebody, like Ed said, somebody that's going to take your bottles up and down the country, put on tastings, put it in bars, that kind of thing, get it known. Because if it's just sitting on shelves, you know, if it's not at the front of those shelves, it's it's very, going to be very difficult for people to choose that over and above anything else. We've, we've got a lot yeah. of choice now, more choice than we've ever had. Yeah, definitely. I think the, you know, not sounding biased, but at the end of the day, all of us who are involved in the British Bourbon Society, we have day jobs. We are doing this, uh, like Andrew said at the beginning, it's a, it's a labour of love. We do it because we're passionate about it. But we are actively uh, interested in helping brands that want to get more exposure. We're not looking for backhanders. We're not looking, you know, for anything. Anyway, we're not trying to do anything nefarious. We're just trying to actually shine a light on brands that are making good product, doing cool things, have got a cool story behind them. I mean, one in particular we've been working with recently, Uncle Nearest. Uh, I mean, undeniably, that story is brilliant, and not many brands are lucky to have a story that impressive. But uh, I think that. Joking aside, BBS is a good forum to engage with because uh, we have a very core um, group of people that are interested in the product, that know the product. People are very well educated in the group uh, and we're only growing. And I think that's through people's sort of, you know, interest in bourbon and American whiskey in general. So I would, I would say we're a pretty good place to start. So when are we going to see you guys fill up a, a charter jet full of bourbon junkies and come tour the bourbon distilleries? Well, Andrew's been doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we a few of us have, actually. Uh, we, we got sent to Nashville and Lynchburg by Uncle Nearest back in November. So we've done Jack Daniels. Uh, we've, we've done uh, uh, Uncle Nearest's new distillery. Uh, it's, it's not finished they haven't finished building it yet, but they gave us the whole tour of Lynchburg, which is incredible. Um, I've been to the Whistlepig Farm in Vermont um, and um, going to Kentucky in February. Yeah, I mean, I think we went, a collection of us went over to um, Tennessee uh, about a month and a half ago now. And it was an amazing trip. And we, you know, ever since we started the group we, we'd always sort of talked about I mean honestly if I could take you through the things we talked about at first it was imagine if we had a website then it was imagine if we had a single barrel then it was oh my god imagine if we you know could hold a happy Van Winkle night and then it was you know imagine if we could go to America together and it's all you know not in that order but it's all happened and this trip to Tennessee was quite eye-opening for a lot of us because Tennessee whiskey maybe gets a bit of a bad rep sometimes. And I think, you know, it's the sort of younger, ugly cousin to Kentucky. And it was amazing. For a bunch of guys that know a lot about American whiskey, we all sat around going, blimey, that's not bad, is it? That's We've been sort of talking this down too much for too long. Uh, and then, yeah, I think, you know, hopefully get to go to, to Kentucky next year and, and go and see what that's all about. But yeah, Tennessee was a was an amazing trip, and it was something that really kind of just made me think differently about American whiskey all over again. When you go to the distilleries, to your point, it's you you, ha, you, you get a newfound appreciation for the spirit, having seen the production firsthand. Just walking around the Jack Daniels distillery was just um, incredible, amazing, probably the, the the best distillery I've I've ever seen. Just in terms of the scale and yeah, it was it was it was beautiful. It was like the Disneyland of mm. distilleries. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, as, as Ed said, you, you do you get a newfound appreciation for the spirit. So where do you guys go from here? Good question, Ivy. Yeah, very good question. Yeah. I I I kind of like what we're doing at the minute in terms of sourcing single barrels and 
you know what? We we try to take a bit of, of a lead from our members as well. Listen to them because we are kind of a, quite a focused group. Invariably, we get told all the time about things that they want. Some of them may be you know, doable. Many of them are pipe dreams, but most of the time, you know, we will we'll try and uh, um, put the wheels in motion. But at the minute, people are happy with what we're doing. We're happy. We've had. Um, We've got eight, we'll be, once the new barrels arrive, we'll be eight single barrel releases. And we'd like to continue that into next year and just keep it more of the same. Yeah, I agree with that. I think our our big thing has always been, well, at the beginning, it was trying to do stuff we didn't think we could do. And then it turned into trying to do stuff that we don't think anyone else has done. And then it was, let's try and get really inventive. And I think all of our, you know, you got to remember, like as an American looking at the UK scene, you're, I don't know, I don't know what the, the truth around this is, but I imagine bourbon societies have just been a thing for a long, long time. And to the UK, it's brand new. And even, you know, us bringing this to people. I mean, I don't, I can't even think of many people who have got the chance to pick their own scotch barrel. I mean, you can go to scotch distilleries and you can bottle your own like any other tourist can, but We've actively got members involved in picking, you know, barrels with American distilleries. And, you know, even the Uncle Nearest bottle, that's the first single barrel they've ever done. I've got no doubt in my mind they're, they're going to become a, a pretty well known uh, and talked about distillery in the years to come. And we, as a, as a British group, have been lucky enough to actually do the first barrel with them. Uh, and I, I feel pretty proud about that. So I think in terms of things that, in the future, it's just about making sure that we can continue to sort of push and do new things that maybe people haven't done before. And we seem to have a good appeal at the moment. So hopefully that will continue. You'll find the British Bourbon Society on Facebook and at their website. We've included the link in our show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. And that's WhiskeyCast In-Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla single malt. Look for the new House Lannister Lagavulin 9-year-old. It's part of the Game of Thrones Single Malt Scotch Whiskey Collection from Diageo and HBO. Look for it at a whiskey shop near you and check out the rest of the Lagavulin Single Malts at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Let's start off with the 2018 edition of the Angel's NB Cask Strength Bourbon. It's bottled at 62% ABV, and the nose has notes of caramel candy, honey, and fudge, along with touches of charred oak and toasted marshmallows. Those flavors form a nice sweet base on the palate for spicy notes of black pepper, allspice, and ginger, along with hints of leather and pipe tobacco. The finish is long, complex, and consistent as it fades away. I'm scoring the 2018 Angel's Envy cask strength a 93. Moving on, let's look at another 2018 cask strength bottling. Lot 40's 2018 cask strength edition from Corby's Northern Border Collection. This year's edition is an 11-year-old Canadian rye whiskey, bottled at 58.4% ABV. The nose is fruity and floral with subtle rye spices and hints of caramel and honey underneath. The taste has a good balance of tree fruits and baking spices, along with toasted caramel and vanilla notes that add complexity and balance. The finish nice and long with subtle spices and hints of tree fruits. I'm scoring the 2018 edition of Lot 40 Cask Strength a 92. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, our tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. 85 years ago, as the end of Prohibition meant a renewed demand for Kentucky bourbon, Ed Shapira and his brothers invested in a new distillery in Bartstown. They bought out their partners later on, and today that little startup is the largest family-owned and operated distillery. Get the entire history at heavenhilldistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. 
Old Pulteney shook up its entire range this year with new packaging and a couple of new whiskeys. Let's start with the no-age statement Old Pulteney Huddert. It's bottled at 46% ABV, and the name comes from Huddert Street in Wick, Scotland, where the distillery is located. The whiskey itself is finished in casks that had previously been filled with peated whiskey. The result? A nose with hints of peat smoke, gorse and heather, along with muted spices and a soft oakiness. The taste has a good balance of peat smoke and spices at first, but the peatiness starts to build up slowly, along with hints of salted caramel underneath. The finish is long as that peatiness gently fades away, along with lingering spices and just a touch of brine. There's a really good complexity to this one. I'm scoring the Old Pulteney Huddert a 94. And Old Pulteney's new 15-year-old single malt is bottled at 46% ABV. The nose has hints of brine and soft spices, along with straw, honey, and a hint of dried flowers. The taste has a hint of smokiness and touches of brine, smoked salmon, ground peppercorns, honey, and vanilla. The finish, nice and long, with subtle pepperiness and just a hint of smoke. I'm scoring the Old Pulteney 15-year-old a 93. I've added these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,400 different whiskeys from around the world. You'll find it at whiskeycast.com. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, presented by Lot 40. Each week, we post a new whiskey photo of the week at the website and on social media. And this week's photo featured the old stills at the Powers Johns Lane Distillery in Dublin. They're now an open-air sculpture garden of sorts at Ireland's National College of Art and Design, which took over the old distillery site after it closed in 1976. Had a couple of comments about that photo on Instagram. Michael Carr, the Powers Global Brand Ambassador we featured on the show last month, who took us around the old distillery site, said this, It's my honor to show good folks our old home. Thanks for a sad but beautiful picture. And our pal Alan Winchester, the master distiller at the Glenlivet and a whiskey history buff, locally made stills, riveted. The stills had been direct fired and the flat-topped wash still had a top entry rummager, hence flat top. Also preserved on site is the steam engine. Compare this arrangement to the model at Jim Beam, a great sight. Thanks for the comments, guys. And Mike W. Simpson asked this question on Twitter. Have you ever gone back and reviewed a whiskey with a different reaction or opinion? Well, it happens occasionally. There have been times when I've gone back and had a different opinion about a whiskey than the first time I tasted it. It might have been as simple as having the sniffles the first time around, or eating something earlier that had a lot of garlic or spices in it. Keep in mind, too, that if you're on medication for something, it can affect your senses of smell and taste as well. Ten years ago, I was a judge in the Malt Maniacs Awards, and we wound up throwing out all of my scores for 183 different whiskeys because it turned out that some medicine I had been prescribed at the time threw me off. We only found out by going through the list of whiskeys after I had turned in my scores and found that I had hammered some whiskeys I normally rate highly. That's an argument for nosing and tasting what you might call a reference dram before you start a critical tasting. Nose and taste a whiskey you know well, and make sure you're getting the same characteristics you usually get before you move on to new whiskeys. 
Mike, thanks for the question. And if you have a question, suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the science, history, and other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. And get your lab coat and pocket protector ready because it's science time. We've had counterfeit whiskeys for almost as long as whiskeys have been collectible. In the past, fakes could best be detected by physical flaws like minor defects on a label, but it's only been in the last several years that scientists have been able to prove the actual whiskeys inside those bottles are fakes. There's a new study now that shows fake whiskeys could be dominating the collector's market. The consulting firm Rare Whiskey 101 worked with scientists at the Scottish University's Environmental Research Center to test 55 bottles of whiskey that were acquired on the secondary market and found 21 of them were obvious fakes. Carbon dating has been used for years to put an age on artifacts found by archaeologists, but it also works with whiskeys. And here's a simple explanation. You see, carbon-14 occurs naturally in the atmosphere at a constant rate, and it's absorbed by all living organic materials, including humans. But in this case, barley absorbs it in the fields. Other factors can affect that baseline level of carbon-14, such as the atomic weapons tests in the 1950s and 60s that increased levels of carbon-14 in the atmosphere that we still see today. In other words, if you can figure out how much carbon-14 is present in a whiskey, you can get a pretty good idea of whether it's actually as old as the label claims. Professor Gordon Cook heads up the Radiocarbon Laboratory at the Scottish University's Environmental Research Centre. Well, I'll give you an example of a, a, a real case. I was given a sample of what was supposed to be 1863 Talisker whisky, and we measure it, and the fraction modern is such that it could either be 2005 or late 1950s. Now, nobody is going to uh, falsify a whisky and say it's, it's 1950s, when that in itself is a very valuable whisky. According to Rare Whiskey 101, the 21 bottles Professor Cook's testing found to be clearly faked could have, if they had been proven to be the real things, had a value of around 635,000 pounds, about $803,000. Those bottles were acquired not only from private owners, but also through auctions and even a retailer. And David Robertson of Rare Whiskey 101 says... Every single bottle of so-called pre-1900 whiskey they've had analyzed in the last two years has been proven to be a fake. Now, what does it cost to have a bottle of whiskey carbon dated? Professor Cook told us his lab can do it for around 400 pounds, about $505. We'll get into that process and the potential impact of these fakes on the whiskey market next time around. In the meantime, if you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey, combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast brought to you by the Whiskey Exchange. 
Please take a minute this week and share Whiskey Cast with your friends and family. If they're not familiar with podcasts, show them how to use that podcast app on their smartphone to discover Whiskey Cast and a whole world of free content. Remember, friends help friends discover podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com, and you'll find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. Have a very Merry Christmas and a great 2019. WhiskeyCast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no Redbreast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.